welcome. Uh, it's been um, it's been a while since I spoke to everybody here, or to, to lots of you. But I'm glad to be back and speaking up. So I want to introduce Phil Santangelo. So Phil, uh, I spoke to him the other day before, just to talk about what was going to happen today, and uh, we start talking about uh, COVID nineteen, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he said something which I which struck me as kind of interesting. He said, "This is exciting time. This is an exciting time." Uh, in, in, in the life of a scientist, and um, which I found kind of interesting because it is an exciting time. Uh, we don't necessarily think about it as exciting. But it is. Uh, the other thing he said is that he doesn't get a lot of sleep because of because of this exciting time. So uh, so that's that. So how do I know Phil? So Phil was in my twelfth grade humanities class in uh, at Farmingdale High School in uh, nineteen eighty seven is when he graduated. It was a senior year and. Uh, I taught him about literature and the love of art and music and aesthetics, et cetera. So he then went to Polytech where he learned engineering and, uh, and, and ignored all of that stuff. Although I'm sure it's, it's in, his, uh, in his DNA somewhere. Uh, when he's a Polytech, he's, he did stuff with fuel injection. With, I don't even know what that means, but uh, and, and all over the course of his career, he is now much more into vaccine connection uh, injection. So, there's something there, but again, you probably read his bio, which is which was sent out to you. Uh, he uh, from Polytech, he went to Purdue, uh, and then UC Davis, uh, where he got his uh, his uh, his last degree, uh, and then some, did some postdoc work as well. Uh, what struck me about Phil particularly is when a friend and I went to visit him in 2017. Uh, he had reached out to me and claimed that I did something nice for him when he was in my class, which I did not recall. Uh, but uh, but uh, he was he was grateful for it anyway. So we, Fran and I and my two grandsons took a tour of uh, of Georgia Tech and to, into his lab, uh, which is which was really exciting because his name is on the front of the building and it's the uh, it's called the Laboratory of Spatial Biology. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, but he is a professor of biomedical engineering both at Georgia Tech and also at Emory, uh, and maybe he can explain how he does two different jobs. Uh, but um, and, and at, at, at this job, uh, at his lab uh, at, at Georgia Tech, uh, he has a host of PhDs who work for him and with him, as well as graduate students and such. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to, uh, to Phil. And I'm going to mute everybody uh, at the same time if they haven't done that. So, so Phil, so, you're up. OK. Is it OK for me to sh uh, I'll share screen, my screen? Please. Then. Yep. Okay. I think we got it. OK. So. Uh, it's great to meet all of you virtually. Uh, I'm Phil Santangelo, as Mike uh, mentioned. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, and my department is kind of weird because it is actually a shared department. So when the department was created, um, it was the whole purpose was to marry the School of Medicine at Emory University with the engineers at Georgia Tech, and essentially to build to, to develop biomedical engineers that could go both, you know, could talk uh, well in the engineering field, but then also uh, very directly with physicians and with folks at the School of Medicine. So the whole idea was to marry the two together. And I think they did a very good job. And so I do my, my home, my lab is actually at the moment at Georgia Tech, actually in a year, it's going to move over to Emory. But at the same time, we kind of are able to move back and forth between universities. And so um, my appointment next year will will change a little bit, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, that's, that's really the whole idea. But it's really to marry um, engineering and medicine in a way that um, was really the most useful, I think, more than anything else. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about next generation treatments for future pandemics. I thought, uh, I think it, it's an exciting time, as Mike said, um, and I think that we have a lot to offer and there's a lot coming in the future that hopefully should help, especially regarding treatments. Okay, it helps if I hit the right button. Okay, so why do we, first of all, why do we need a new paradigm for antivirals? In general, the most effective antiviral drugs that we have are for HIV. Those have been wildly successful. But in general, antivirals for other pathogens, to be honest, have been quite disappointing. The ones for flu are, for influenza are okay, but still really not terribly effective. So we really need a new paradigm. 
I'll also then talk about CRISPR proteins. So some of you may have heard about Intellia's work with Cas9 to, to perform gene editing in people recently. Well, CRISPR proteins, though, don't they don't just include Cas9, and I'll explain what that is, but they include a whole host of other proteins that have an incredible functionality. They can do a number of different things that are very exciting, and we're using those essentially to either prevent infection or to treat infection. But the problem with these proteins, they can certainly be therapeutic, but the problem with them is how do you deliver them? Delivering proteins in general is difficult. It's hard. Most companies are not very good at it. Other than giving antibodies intravenously, in general, we're, it's very hard to deliver proteins to cells. So we actually use synthetic mRNA technology. So we use the same type of technology that Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech have used in the vaccines, except we're not using them as vaccines in this case. We're using them to develop therapeutics. So I'm going to introduce what I mean by synthetic mRNA. Many of you have probably heard about this, especially when you were going to get your vaccines. But the problem is most folks don't actually know what they are. And I think that's been part of the vaccine hesitancy is not actually understanding when someone says it's an mRNA-based vaccine, or in my case, an mRNA-based therapy. What does that mean? So we'll talk about that. I'll then talk a little bit about delivery formulations, like how do we formulate that RNA in order to deliver it? And I'll talk about administration routes too. And then last, I'm going to talk about how we use one CRISPR protein, Cas13, as an antiviral agent. And if I have time, I'll talk about another way that we can use Cas9 as, a, as a, essentially a preventative, a way to prevent infection. OK. So one of the issues, so you have probably noticed, we do not exactly have tons of, of drugs against COVID. We um, actually have remdesivir, which is kind of eh, and we also have some antibodies that people have been treated with that have been maybe more effective. But in general, the problem is, is that these drugs are hard to find and they usually have to attack a specific part of the virus life cycle. So what I have on the left is essentially what viruses do. They have to bind and get into a cell. They have to come apart. They then use the machinery of the cell to make more of themselves. That's what every virus does. They have to use the cellular machinery to make more of themselves. And when people are developing small molecule drugs, they're usually looking to inhibit some part of that process, maybe entry, so the, how the virus gets into the cell. They may, have to, they may actually target its polymerase. Now, a polymerase, I won't get into what it is. I can tell you what it does. It's a protein that basically helps the virus replicate. And so remdesivir actually inhibits the polymerase of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. It inhibits it uh, to some degree. There's another drug, which you've probably seen uh, uh, that's, I think it's called, um, I'll have to go back and look at it. But basically the drug they're using to cure hep C, one of the drugs in it is also a polymerase inhibitor. And actually hep C and COVID look a lot of like, though they work very differently. Um, just the same, usually these drugs are against um, various different parts of the virus life cycle but it's hard to find them. And in many cases, you know, it, and it's hard to find these small molecules and antibodies are an option, but they're hard to find too. So the other issue with any of these drugs is resistance. Sometimes they have difficulty keeping up with replication dynamics. SARS-CoV-2 replicates incredibly fast. It makes ridiculous amounts of RNA in a very short period of time. It's an RNA virus, it makes lots and lots of RNA. Uh, matter of fact, it's almost disturbing how much RNA it makes. When we first started working with it, we would get the results back from, um, from certain assays, ways to measure it, and I couldn't believe how high the RNA levels were. The other issue is delivery. Small molecules, sometimes they have issues with solubility. They have the issues with pharmacokinetics. They also have issues with toxicology. I have a number of colleagues at UGA that have a great drug that works wonderful in vitro, but it causes kidney failure in animals. So probably not going to be a very good choice. The virus doesn't like it, but neither do people. So that's not going to be a good idea either. So it's there are a lot of issues with trying to find small molecules. So. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get to CRISPR in a minute, but I was going to mention one other thing. So one of the issues, the United States military basically identified the fact that 
small molecule drugs were hard to find. So two years ago, um, a program was initiated called DARPA Prepare. And I'm actually one of the PIs, one of the principal investigators who runs a program uh, associated with DARPA Prepare. And they identified two years ago that we couldn't find good drugs against viruses. And so that's where this work came from. It came from the idea that we needed a plug and play methodology to attack viruses. And that's what this work is about. To be honest with you, DARPA had this idea many years ago. So the US military, a number of years ago, had an idea that they needed a plug and play vaccine technology. And guess what that gave us? That gave us the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. So DARPA invested heavily, and in CureVac too, which didn't do as well recently, but just the same, so, so they invested just, in that technology. So can you just uh, Explain what DARPA is. Just like you know. But so the, DARPA uh, is a DARPA is a part of the uh, Department of Defense that basically um, invests in crazy ideas that they think are going to change the world. That is really, and they they are mostly about. Um, really about, uh, they are military focused, but they're also national defense focused. And so when you think about um, pandemics, clearly, I think we've seen this now quite clearly that pandemics have a huge effect on the country, right? I mean, on the economy, on people's daily lives, hugely impactful. So part of what DARPA does is invest in the US military, invest in technologies that they hope will prevent pandemics, generate new vaccines, but technology that they really feel like is going to be impactful. But the one thing about that organization is they like risk. They don't mind you proposing I don't want to say crazy ideas, but um, far out ideas that have the potential to change the world. And hopefully you'll see that in some of what I'm going to talk about. So one of the program managers, uh, Renee Wegrazin, who's no longer at DARPA, she actually moved on to a company called Ginkgo Bioworks in Boston. But Renee had this idea that CRISPR proteins might be the key to this. And so when people say CRISPR, what does that mean? It stands for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Repeat DNA Sequences. Now that's a mouthful, but really what it is, is it's, it was a set of, um, of DNA that's repeated, that was found in bacteria that's repeated many times in their genome. And when people first saw this, they were like, what is this? Why do, why do uh, bacteria have these repeated sequences? And what they noticed is that the repeated sequences were actually separated by other small pieces of DNA that are called spacers. And what they realized was that these spacers actually corresponded to viruses that attack bacteria. Bacteria can be attacked by viruses. And what they realized is that these, that these sequences were there as a part of a mechanism to, for a bacteria to basically protect itself from viruses. And so one of the first proteins that was discovered that sits very nearby in the genome of a bacteria, of bacteria is, uh, sits nearby these repeated sequences is this protein Cas9. And what Cas9 does, and you may have heard about this in the news, that if you take this protein Cas9 and you combine it with a piece of RNA, RNA that is such, very similar to this repeated sequence that's in their genome, this repeat this piece of RNA along with Cas9, they form a complex. And what it allows you to do is cut DNA. It allows you to make a double-stranded cut in DNA. And this is what that company Intelia was using to do gene editing in people to solve the particular problem that they had. What's interesting though, so let me move on to the next slide, is that, as I said, Cas, when they say Cas9, or I'm going to talk about Cas13, these are what's called, these proteins are called CRISPR-associated genes. So these are proteins that are associated with those repeated sequences. That's all they really are. But these are just proteins and nucleic acids that come from bacteria. So what we've been able to do, and other groups, is that you can basically take these bacterial proteins, and if you put them into, uh, into mammalian cells, into our cells, they actually work. And that's what Jennifer Doudna actually won the Nobel Prize for. She was able to show that, um, that you could take these sequences, put them in human cells, and they actually worked. And that has just caused an explosion of different tools and techniques. But that's what CRISPR is. Cas9 is a protein that when bound to a guide can cause double-stranded breaks in DNA and can cause you to edit DNA. So let me move on to the next slide. 
What's exciting though, is it, it gave all of these fascinating constructs that people made. So we in the lab can take the sequence for Cas9 and we can turn it into mRNA and we can make it do, we can make it function in cells. So some people are using Cas9 for gene editing. That's not what we're doing, but some people are. The other thing is that you can make mutations, changes in Cas9 that turn it off. And then you can literally glue it to other proteins to give it other functions. So you can actually use a dead version of Cas9. The dead means it doesn't cut DNA, but you can use it to bind to DNA and turn genes on. You can also use it to turn genes off. And that's what this gene regulation part is. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you can actually use it to control gene expression. And we're doing that in my lab. We're doing it to, though to make cells resistant to viruses. Another protein that's important is Cas13. So it's another CRISPR pro associated protein. It works differently though. What it does is that when coupled to a guide strand, uh, another piece of RNA, it can bind to RNA and actually acts like a Pac-Man. Essentially it activates and chews up RNA. And that's the way we're using it to kill viruses. It basically, we're using it to chew up viral RNA in cells. So this CRISPR technology, the reason when you hear this and why people get so excited is because it has all of these exciting functionalities. You can take these proteins, you can glue them with other proteins, and you can get them to do incredible things in cells. And that's why people are excited by them. Okay. So we are specifically using Cas13 as a, as a drug. And why do I want to use Cas13 as a drug against, against the RNA viruses? Well, one is that they are basically what's called an RNA powered activatable RNAs. Now that's a mouthful, but basically what it means is that when that protein, it has two parts of it. It has uh, a part that binds to another little, we call a CRISPR RNA or guide strand. It binds to another little piece of RNA. When it binds to it, uh, if it hits a target like a virus, uh, if it hits it and binds to that target, it activates and chews up viral RNA. And so it's an exciting way to basically chew up viral RNA. And what we've found so far is that it's rapid, seems to be pretty specific, uh, very specific. It seems to persist. So it just keeps chewing for a while, a uh, few days actually. And uh, what it allows us to do is target different parts of viruses. It also, this was the exciting part, it allowed us to go from, we initially were doing flu research. We were able to pivot from flu to SARS-CoV-2 and they are very different viruses, but all we had to change was the sequence of that guide strand. All we had to do was change it so that it bound to the SARS virus, to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, have it bind to it and it would activate against it. We were able to take one drug and make another drug against another virus in literally days. I mean, if we were a bit further ahead and had a company associated with this, which we hopefully will in the future, um, the whole idea is we could have gone from one drug to another pathogen really, really fast. And that is why DARPA and why the US military likes this technology because it's plug and play. You can attack one virus, you can attack another virus and you can do it very quickly. It's finding small molecules that work against one virus and then work against another takes months and months and years, and it takes too long. So that's really the whole idea is that we are generating a toolbox that can be used against lots of viruses. Now, I want to mention one other technology. I mentioned that dead versions of Cas9 can be fused to other proteins, and what they can do is activate genes. And so we use one called, this is called Viper. And so we use DCAS9 Viper. We are using it to turn genes on in the lung. We're using it to turn on genes that we know. When I say turn on a gene, I mean uh, activate it at the uh, DNA level, not cut, just activate it, make, and make a protein in the lung that would normally not always be there. But we're doing that to make the lung resistant to viruses because it's one thing to treat it, that's, but you have to be infected to treat it, and that's not always great. <laughs> and so if we can prevent it, this is a way for us to prevent it. We're basically making the lung resistant to that particular virus. And I'll talk more about that technology. So, but the problem is, is that these proteins are super exciting and very powerful, but how do we make them in the body? And so that's where synthetic RNA comes in. And so when we talk about synthetic messenger RNA, we need to take a very quick step back. So every, all of the cells in your body that have a nucleus contain DNA, and that's your genetic code. 
But that DNA is essentially a code that is first transcribed pieces of it into messenger RNA. Those messenger RNAs that are made in the nucleus then make their way out to the cytosol, to the outside of the nucleus, but still inside the cell, and they get translated into protein. They are the template that's used to make protein. What a synthetic mRNA is, it's just another mRNA. It's the same, very similar to the ones your body makes, but we can encode, we can design into it the ability to make practically any protein. I don't want to say any protein, but practically any protein. And the nice thing about this is that we only have to get it, we don't have to even get it into the nucleus and it can still make protein. So when we make mRNA in the lab or if Moderna makes it or BioNTech that provides it with, or that supplies them to Pfizer, we make them in a tube. So we start with a DNA template. We then add enzymes to it and it basically produces the bulk of the RNA. We then add another enzyme to put a cap on it. And essentially all mRNAs have this special molecule on the end on one side of it. And that's there to help it get translated into protein. There's this thing called an open reading frame. This is just where we put our sequence for our gene of interest. So a sequence for the protein we wanna make. And then all of them have this, um, a tail uh, that has a specific sequence that is uh, a part of its stability. It makes it last longer. And so we literally make this in a tube and so does Moderna and BioNTech. So there is no cellular material used to make this. We take DNA that has been synthesized synthetically. We add enzymes to it, mix it up in a tube, wait overnight and we get RNA. And then we add another enzyme to put the cap on. We put another enzyme to put the tail on. And then we, and then we process it and clean and we basically uh, purify it. But it's not made in, cell, in cells. So for even for vaccines or for therapies, this is great because some people are allergic to, to material that's in cells. And so, uh, I mean, some, many of the flu vaccines are made in eggs. Well, they have egg proteins. And so some people can't take those vaccines. Our synthetic mRNA does not contain anything from a cell. It's just the mRNA, just like it would look like, just like your body would make it. Now, there are a few small things that are done to make it more uh, potent. And one of the things is that we change one nucleotide. We change the chemistry slightly using natural chemistry, but we change the chemistry and that makes it essentially more potent. But in general, one of the things why this, why this technology whoops, is so important is that it's transient. Expression only lasts up to five days tops it go, and the RNA is degraded through normal pathways. So it's transient. We know it's highly unlikely to integrate into your genome. So it doesn't integrate. We've had no evidence that they integrate in any way. And we know that they have very low immunogenicity. So this is one of the real powers of this technology. Okay. One of the other issues though, is that when you deliver mRNA into a cell, there are a lot of sensors that your cell has, every, all of your cells have to look for foreign RNA. There's lots of them inside the cell. Well, we need to get rid of, we need to prevent those uh, from actually sensing our drug. And so there's lots of ways to do it and different companies do it different ways. Uh, CureVac and another company called Translate Bio um, is in Massachusetts. They basically change the sequence in order to do this. Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech add a, a modified nucleotide. You don't have to understand that. They just change the chemistry a little bit. Um, and then all of them purify in some way, either using um, various methods to do so, but they want a very pure product at the end. And the reason is some of the enzymes that we use to make the RNA make what we call junk RNA. And that's kind of sad, but we purify that out. And so that's the way that they get rid of the immunogenicity. So most of the RNAs that are used are not terribly immunogenic at all. And we don't want them to be because we don't want our therapies to cause immune responses. Now we have to formulate it to deliver it. And so uh, again, we are using them to encode, they encode those CRISPR proteins, but we still have to deliver the RNA. And how do we do that? In the liver, you tend to use these lipid nanoparticles, similar to what Moderna and Pfizer use. And they use them also for intramuscular delivery in the muscle and lymph nodes in particular. Um, if you want to deliver it intradermal into the skin, uh, CureVac does some of that. They formulate it with another molecule called protamine. We've done work in the heart in another project where we actually just, I mean, it sounds crazy, but inject, they inject naked mRNA and saline directly into the heart. It's not really formulated at all. It's just naked RNA. 
In the lung, my group has been using polymers basically to deliver the RNA and mostly by nebulizer. And so we're developing these uh, for respiratory viruses, for SARS and for flu, we're delivering it by a nebulizer. We're even doing intravaginal delivery of RNA and we actually there it's delivered naked in water. And so we can actually deliver to the vagina and the cervix also. And we're doing that for lots of reasons, mostly for against uh, to prevent uh, sexually transmitted infections. And so RNA is very, very powerful, but at the same time, you do have to formulate it in different ways, depending on where you're delivering it in the body and what you're trying to get it to do. Okay. And I'm going to skip the LNPs a bit. So our first experiments with Cas13 were we actually made an RNA that encoded Cas13. You can see that here in blue. And the first thing that we did is we tested in a tube, literally. We take this RNA, we put the CRISPR RNA, which is helps it find who it needs to attack. Um, and then we put a target that was similar, sort of representing the virus. And we see if it cuts RNA in, in a tube. And we did. So on our first experiments, we showed that even within minutes, it's cutting RNA. And that's what this signal is here. The signal goes up when it's cutting RNA. And that's what you can see. We cut RNA like crazy. And this on this gel here, we can look at the RNA. And this smear means that we cut up the RNA that uh, has a very distinct band into a bunch of little pieces. So we know that it's cutting it up into basically destroying it. This was good because this was our first step. Could we make the mRNA that encoded it? Could we test if it was functional? And it is. So we can get it to kill RNA. The next thing that we did is we actually looked to see if it could kill native genes. So other RNAs in cells. So we looked at a gene called PPIB, not important, but we actually showed that we could decrease the levels of PPIB mRNA in cells by about 50 to 60%. And so we were very excited and we do, I should say all these experiments, if you're doing biological research, you need to do controls. Controls are very important. Make sure that you're, what you're seeing is really what you think it is because biological experiments can fool you sometimes, which is very annoying, but uh, they can definitely fool you. So we use controls. We actually used a dead version of Cas13. So it can bind, but it doesn't cut. And you can see it didn't really change gene expression. Same thing, we use a non targeted we use a guide strand that doesn't target a vi uh, doesn't target ppib and we didn't see any changes at all and then we look at untreated too and sometimes we look at some other controls too but the point is is we run number of controls to make sure that when we're cutting rna it's because cas13 is really cutting it not something else so cas13 as i said it's really our drug here but this is how we essentially were testing it and I'll move on a little bit quicker. We also did some experiments, and these graphs are kind of complicated, but the point is that we, we, looked, at, we looked at knocking, killing PPIB, so cutting PPIB, that gene, but we wanted to see, did it cut anything else? And fortunately, it did not. These graphs are basically saying that no other genes even change their amounts by about a factor of two, which is a very small amount. And so fortunately, we saw that when we used Cas13, we weren't changing other genes. And that was really important to us so that it was specific, only cutting the gene we wanted to cut. So these were really just preliminary experiments. This is what we really want to go after. This is influenza. And so this is what influenza has eight separate strands of RNA in its genome. It enters into cells by endocytosis. It gets taken up into a vesicle. It then bursts the vesicle and dumps its, its genome, which are eight separate strands of RNA, into the cell. They then make their way into the nucleus where they have a party, essentially. They make lots of RNA. That RNA goes back into the, uh, the outs outside of the nucleus. It makes a ton of protein, and that protein all leads to making more viral particles to go infect more cells. Um, this is how viruses tend to work. They, they don't all work exactly this way, but they all are very similar. They have to get into a cell. They use the cellular machinery to make lots and lots of copies of themselves. They make messenger RNAs. They make more RNA because their genome is RNA. And then not DNA, they make RNA. And then it assembles using parts and pieces of the cell and makes more particles. So when someone asks you what a virus is, 
this is a virus, this particle here, and they're typically around 100 nanometers or so in size. So much smaller, about one tenth the size of a human hair. So they're very hard to see. There are ways to see them using fancy microscopes, but in general, they're hard to see. But this is what a virus is. And I think people have probably seen some of the uh, electron microscopy of COVID and seen the spikes coming out of it. Most viruses do have spiky proteins coming out, out of them, and they use those to actually enter the cell. And so all viruses have to use cellular machinery in order to function. So when we deliver our drug, we want to get it into the same cells so that it chews up this RNA. We want to chew up the viral RNA, all of these little strands here, we want to chew them up. Okay. So the problem with flu though, as you all know from flu vaccines, is that they're very diverse and you have different strains that are basically found um, all the time and there's different circulating ones every year and that's why you have to get a different vaccine uh, essentially every year. So we did some work with the CDC and we looked at basically all of the virus strains that they have ever characterized for the last hundred years, essentially from about 1918 until now. And so when we did this, we found a sequence, or a, a, lar a fairly large sequence that is uh, basically associated with the um, one of the strands of RNA. And we found that this sequence, fortunately, in terms of H1N1, H3N2s, and H2N2s, these are the viruses that have caused problems over the last 100 years, that we could hit 99.1% of all of those viruses. So not 100, I'll admit nothing's perfect, but we could hit 99% of those viruses. That was super exciting. We also found um, uh, sequences that would hit H5N1s, those are avian flus, H7s, which are avian too. Uh, we could hit swine flus also. It was really exciting that we could find sequences that were conserved, not a huge region, but we could find ones that were conserved across all of these viruses. And the whole goal of that is we want our flu drug to work against all of these strains. We don't want to go find a new drug every time a new flu strain comes out. So the first thing that we had to do though, is I've told you about Cas13 and I've told you it has a little guide RNA. So when we deliver this drug, we deliver an mRNA that, that basically makes the protein Cas13. And then we deliver a little guide RNA that tells it where to kill. And so uh, what to kill. But the problem is we never know what sequences are gonna work. So we have to try a bunch of them, which is very annoying, but it's not hard and it can be done fairly rapidly. And so we screened a bunch of these and this one M4 is actually Actually turned out to be one of our best ones. And you can see that it reduces the amount of flu always greater than 50%, but in some cases actually almost 100%, very, very close to 100%. So we were very excited about this particular guide, but you have to go through this and some of them do work better than others. And we target different parts of the virus, all super conserved though, so that we wanted to make sure it would work against any flu strain. And so this one is the one that we really like the best. And actually this is currently our lead candidate to be moved forward and hopefully in about a year or so, or maybe a year or two into the clinic. That's really the idea, but this is our lead candidate. And we so, did so, lots so, of, yeah. So can I ask a question? Yeah. So you, you said you looked at all of the flus from since uh, for the last hundred years. Yes. Uh, and, and, and then you were looking at your current uh, ability to uh, attack them. Yes. And, and that's how you figured out, that's how you're thinking about the future then. That's that, exactly that, correct. I mean, that we makes sense? Want, okay. absolutely. And I'll tell you in just a minute, we did sort of something similar with SARS. So with SARS-CoV-2, with co the virus that causes COVID, we did the same thing. We aligned a whole bunch of sequences and tried to find sequences that were really, really highly conserved. And so when we target COVID, which I'll show in just a minute, we do not go after the spike. The spike is a disaster. I mean, you've heard about the spike, that's what's in the vaccine. But the problem is the spike changes. That's what these variants are. The spike is, there are other sequences that change, but it's mostly in the spike. We didn't want to target the spike. I don't want to go near the spike because the spike's going to change on me in five minutes. So instead, we actually target another part of the virus that doesn't change very much. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But even in vitro with these viruses, we do time courses. We want to make sure it's going to cut it over time. And we looked at over three days. So one dose of our drug over three days really, really was hurting it. <laughs> it was knocking it down quite a lot. I mean, over 90% basically in that case. So we were, we were really happy about that. So COVID shows up. And so we have to do the same thing. We're keeping Cas13 the same, but we need a new guide to tell it where to go kill. 
The problem is COVID's different. And so instead of using the assay I just showed you, we used a simpler assay. One positive thing about COVID is that it kills cells really well. I mean, it's really good at killing cells. And so that's what you're seeing here. So this is essentially a, a plastic, we have these plastic dishes that we put cells into and they line the bottom of the plastic. So each one of these wells has cells on the bottom of them. And if you stain them with a dye, we literally add dye to them. This is what you get, they turn blue. Is if you see a well that's completely blue, that means all the cells are there and happy and having a nice time. What happens, what ha what happens if I add SARS to this, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID? It kills them all in about three days. That's why it's white. So white means all the cells have died. Blue means all the cells are happy. We want all the cells to be happy. So what we did is that we delivered our, uh, we delivered a lot of these different, these represent different guides not in the spike, but in, in a different part of the, and we, we looked for guides that save the cells. This one, N3.2, is one of our favorite guides. It saved about 80% of the cells. Our, we did lots of controls, and you can see this is our controls. Everybody's dead. And so that's good. That's what we wanted to happen. This was the good part. All 80% of the cells are living. If we combined it with another guide, it was a little bit, maybe a little bit better, but in general, they were doing great. So. We also tested it again under some slightly different conditions. We're saving the cells. This is our drug treated. This is a control. This is virus only. Most of the cells are dead here. Most of the cells are dead. Here the cells are, pre are pretty much all living. This was a good thing. And so this was very exciting. So then we quantified how much we were knocking down the virus and in different cell types. The problem with COVID is that SARS-CoV-2 is it doesn't infect every cell, it, uh, these cells have to have specific characteristics. The take home is here. In, in, in Vero cells, these are monkey cells that this virus, like SARS literally likes a lot. We got about 93, 94% knockdown. In HUH cells, which are another, which are a human cell line, we got, uh, I mean, over 99% knockdown. We were super excited. This is where we were like, okay, this is even better than what we were getting with flu. This is fantastic, especially since this is a pandemic virus. And so uh, this was a good thing. So we then went ahead and more recently and tested it against the, uh, the, the, the English, the UK variant. So this is Washington one, which is the strain that's been used, sort of the original strain. It's exactly the same as the Wuhan strain that came out of China. And you can see 3.2 is doing a beautiful job against it, saving all the cells. Here's the control. Most of the cells are dead, again, kind of sad. Um, we then went ahead and tried it against the variant. And this was actually with a lot of virus. Um, this MOI metric means we used a lot of virus. 3.2 did extremely well. Controls, all dead. This is another one we were testing. Didn't do quite as well, but, but 3.2 was just rocking and did the same thing at a lower amount of virus. So 3.2 is doing very, very well, both with Washington 1 and with the B117 UK variant. And we're going to be testing it against Delta very soon. Uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Georgia just got Delta. He's growing it up so that we can use it. So that's coming next. But the bigger question is, can we do this in vivo? I mean, I've been showing you cells. Cells are nice. Cells doesn't mean it's going to work in vivo. So we actually made a device that we could use with mice, hamsters, and ferrets, where the mice go into these little tubes, and there's a little nose cone at the end. It's a 3D printed nose cone, and their little heads go right into them. So amazingly, mice like to, they'll go into the little tubes, they'll stick their head in, and we'll get three in at once, and we have a nebulizer. This is an Aerogen Pro nebulizer. It is an FDA approved nebulizer. We add our drug basically to this, and we can give it to the animals. The problem is we needed to know how to formulate it. So one of the chemists in my lab came up with, I don't know, it's now up to about 250 polymers that we were using. So we take the polymer, we add it to the RNA, the mRNA that encodes Cas13 and the guide, they glue them together, we put them in the nebulizer, give it to the animals. This color, the coloring, these are actually lungs from individual animals. But what this allows us to do is see how much expression we're actually getting. And so in this case, this was uh, in a mouse and we could use very low doses in a mouse. We went to hamsters, we were getting great expression. The colors just mean there's a lot of protein being made by the drug. So it makes, in a sense, lots of Cas13. And we did this in ferrets and did a fantastic job. And here you can see the ferret's nose sticking out of the nose cone. And it is true, we have to take their lungs out in order to look at them. 
which we don't like to do that much. It's a pro I, ha I have to admit it's one of the problems with biological research, but the point is it was able to, we were able to show that our delivery method worked with three different species. We then went ahead and actually did this in a non-human primate. And that's what you're seeing. This is our lead delivery candidate. This is lungs from a, a rhesus macaque. And we got a, we had a great result. We were seeing very high, uh, essentially, delivery into these animals with our, with our drugs. So next for us will be humans. We have some more steps to do to get there. But we have a way to deliver it using a nebulizer. And so at CVS, or um, I'm not sure which, which pharmacies you all go to, but uh, I haven't lived in New York in a while. But, but um, the point, though, is that uh, if you go into a lot of them, you'll find vibrating mesh nebulizers, very similar. Uh, Flip is one. I think Philips has another one. They're very similar to the ones that we use. So now we can deliver the drug, this, these RNAs, into the lung. So our drug has an mRNA that encodes for Cas13. It has a guide strand that targets the virus. We have this polymer that we add to it, and that makes our drug that is inhalable, that we know can be nebulized and delivered into the lungs. And that really is the drug that we're making. And if we want to go from one virus to another, all we have to do is change a sequence of this guide strand. Nothing else has to be changed for the lung. We can use this vehicle. And if we need to do this in the liver, which we're going to be doing for Ebola, actually, in the near future, actually, um, we change this vehicle. We can change it to a lipid nanoparticle, something similar to the vaccine formulations. Take the same similar RNA with this. So you can see. It's a plug and play technology. You're not starting from scratch. You can go from one virus to another and just change the, change the you can change just a sequence in the cargo or you can change the delivery. It's like Legos for attacking viruses. That's really what this is about. That's the whole point. And the whole point is to do it fast, not have to wait a year before or two years. So if we can get these FDA approved, and that the FDA will deal with plug and play because they're having a little issue, a few issues with that. It's scaring them, I think, to death. But I think with some work, we can show them that this plug and play type of uh, architecture is the way to go. We did this with flu, um, and I'll just skip to this slide here. We showed with flu, we could save uh, uh, mice from flu. These, the one in the red here, all died, for, uh, died had to be put down, actually euthanized for flu. These all survived, and we got about a log, about 10, 90% uh, knockdown actually in vivo in a mouse for flu. We went to COVID and this was probably the one of the more interesting experiments. So we we basically we did treat them first because it was a little bit easier to do but they were then challenged with COVID. We then waited 5 days and we tracked their weights. Well the green here is the drug. The other stuff are controls. So if you watch the, what happened with them, yeah, the first day or so they were kind of struggling with the virus a little bit. But by day three, they were coming back. By day four, they were completely normal. They looked just like the uninfected animals. This was so exciting for us because these animals, unfortunately, get really sick from COVID. They don't die. And you can see that even in the controls. They lose, they don't even, they lose weight for a while and they start to get better, but they're not very happy here. And so here, though, they're doing great. And so we were able to use this drug in a, in a hamster model to show that we could essentially treat them. And we only gave them one dose. So over this six day period, Period. They got. They only got one dose of our drug. Now we're looking at multi-dosing. We're actually able to concentrate the drug a bit more. So there's a lot going on. And I want to show you the difference in their lungs. So this is the lungs from the hamsters. The white dots are virus. So this is SARS-CoV-2 RNA, so COVID RNA in their lungs. And you can see it's pretty awful. It's all over the place. This is not great. Um, it's kind of unfortunate but this is the one that we treated. There's still some, and we're looking at how to improve this, but look at the airways. These are the deep airways that are really important for you to actually breathe. And this is why the animals were happy because their deep airways were, didn't have all that virus in it. So we were really, really pleased by that. So that's, I mean, to me, a picture sometimes uh, tells the whole story. To me, this image really shows the difference. And these are just single images, but they're representative of the data. So this is bad, this is a whole lot better. So, so uh, we have a question from Kathy. She wants to know yeah. if you're working with the CDC with these results. So not yet, but I would say that they are so busy with their vaccine work that we're not working with them at the moment. 
but we are working with some other government agencies regarding this. So, um, I mean, this is funded by the military and they have a couple of labs actually in DC that we're working with. There's a place called USAMRID. We're gonna be working with them. There's other places in the government that, and the government's very well aware of this. Basically every Monday, we have to send data to DARPA and it goes to the Pentagon if it's good. <laughs> and so essentially um, that is pretty much our weekly pain and suffering. But you can see in the deep part of the lung, we got about 95% reduction of viral RNA. So we were very excited by this. Um, and I just want to show one other experiment real fast, and then I'll stop and we can do even more questions. A colleague of mine at Duke University, Nick Heaton, found that a gene called B4 Gallant 2 doesn't matter, it's a gene in your genome, that if you if it gets upregulated, meaning you make lots of B4 gallon 2 protein, it is incredibly potent for preventing avian influenza infections. I mean, very potent. So cells that have this gene upregulated, difficult to infect them. So we wanted to basically see could we upright, so create a new drug? So I mentioned this DCAS9 thing. So it's a version of Cas9, CRISPR protein, that does not cut, but binds to DNA. And this thing called Viper, and Viper basically activates genes. So we have an mRNA for it, and another guide that tells it where in the DNA to bind, but not cut. We added a polymer to this, and then we del can deliver this into the lungs. And so, the first thing we had to do was find guides. So you do more screening. We had to find guides that turned on this gene and in mouse cells. This is the kind of work, the data that we get out of it. The important thing is we found actually five guides that really turned this gene on. They did a great job. We had some that were pretty crummy. They didn't work very well, but we had others that worked great. And so once we find guides that work, then we did another experiment. We gave them first this drug. We waited two days. And then we infected them with a lot of influenza. This is what's called basically 10 times the lethal dose of flu. And so we gave them 10, tenfold the amount that will kill them. And this is what happened. All the ones that got our drug all survived. They were all very happy. They didn't lose any weight. They were happy mice. And unfortunately, all the ones that got the controls were basically had to be euthanized the day four. So this is another way at preventing infections. And this is something that, you know, CAS-13 is really good for treating. This is much better for preventing infection. Again, this is all still in mice and we have a, quite a bit of work to do, but we are moving towards large animal models now. And the delivery that we've been doing in these other animals is really important. So, and we basically completely negated the virus. I mean, the virus went, I mean, it was pretty much, there was no virus in, these, in, the, in the lungs at all. That's what you're seeing here. This is virus in the lung not very happy. Uh, here's our, our staining in the lung. We couldn't find the virus. I mean, we really barely could find it at all. So this is a very potent, um, and I just want to mention, there's a lot of folks who get involved in this work. Um, I have a bunch of different postdocs who work on this and folks who have PhDs, uh, technicians, and other labs that are involved in our work. But, um, and this is funded through the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is DARPA. And so, uh, and it's a basically, it is a part of the United States military. And so that's, I, I guess I hope this gives you some hope that in the future, there will be some plug and play drugs that will not take forever to actually be implemented and that can be administered in a way that you could even administer them to yourself at home and uh, should be potent against a, a, a many different respiratory viruses. I mean, another virus we're looking at is, R, is RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. It's important in babies, but also in adults, especially over say 65. Um, human metanumo is another one that we're looking at. That's also in, important in the same population. So um, in the liver, we're gonna be looking at Ebola. Um, we're also looking at flaviviruses like dengue and West Nile. And so we have a whole bunch of viruses that we're trying to take the same basically technique and tool to see if we can, again, plug and play against lots and lots of different viruses. I hope, I hope that was as, I know this stuff is complicated and kind of messy, but I hope that uh, you got a sense of new technology using mRNA. So same kind of technology that's in the vaccines, but at the same time that can be used for treatments. And hopefully you can walk away with the idea that we should be able to, to basically target lots of different viruses, not just one and come up with these, come up with these drugs more quickly. Wow. Um, unfortunately we have, uh, this has been recorded. So, uh, you know, those of us who really want, want to get more into it can, can go back and watch it again. Uh, I, have I have two questions, Phil. One is, uh, 
One is something you mentioned to me uh, in 2017, where you were talking about pace, the pacemaker gene. Uh, yeah. And I don't know where you are on that, but can you, can you just explain yeah, what that so, was all about? Yeah, so a colleague of mine at Emory has been trying to find a way to replace pacemakers. So instead of having this device, and they're making better ones and smaller ones, but in the end, you still have this device inserted in your body and electrodes that basically get wired into your heart muscle. And, you know, that it sounds, actually, it looks a lot worse than it sounds, to be honest, uh, when I've seen it. Uh, and I have to admit, I guess I didn't really even quite grasp exactly what was going on with pacemakers. And so uh, a colleague of mine introduced me to the technology, and I realized this is this has got some deficiencies. If the leads break uh, the wires, they actually leave them in there and they just put in a new one and screw in more wires. And so, and it's been very successful. So I, I don't want to take away from that at all, but it would be very nice if you could come up with a different solution. So a colleague of mine at Emory discovered a gene called T-Box 18, that if you express that gene in cardiac and cardi in basically in cardiomyocytes, you can cause them to change their function and become pacemaker cells, the cells that pace the heart. And so he, but he's had trouble for years now introducing it into the heart. He used viruses at first and that's a mess. And so when I met him and we met actually giving an exam, we were on an oral exam together. We just started talking. Um, I said, you know, we might try mRNA. And so he was excited by that. And so we did encode T-Box 18 to, into mRNA and we got a cardiologist at Emory uh, to do the injections both in rats and in pigs. In pigs, they actually, it's kind of awful. They go in and fry the AV node. So a part of your heart, so the conduction, part of the conduction pathway in your heart so that you are looking like you need a pace, pacemaker. And so, but then we went in and gave our gene and honestly, you know, it has shown really, really positive results. And so essentially they have catheters that they can put in through your leg essentially, and they can go into your heart and give an injection. And I thought, to be honest, I thought this was kind of crazy at first, but the cardiologist was like, no, 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 we do this all the time. It's no big deal. I'm like, okay, sounds good. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're doing it, not me. And so, uh, but they can do this and they went in, especially in the pigs, it's, they're able to do it very similarly to how they would do this in people. And essentially it'd be giving you an injection versus having a device put in you. And so far it's looked really good. The pigs that got the injection essentially uh, within, I mean, within a day are running around like normal pigs again. And the ones that didn't get it or got a control, basically their heart rates just don't get up very, you know, are, are, are still very low. And so, so far that's looked really astounding. And so, and they may, we're looking at durability. So how long does it last? And that's something that there's ongoing tests on, but so far it looks really promising. And interestingly enough, it seems Novartis is interested in the technology and we're in the midst of talking with them about licensing this technology to Novartis. And they would be a great group for, to take it further and take it into the clinic. I'm not a cardiovascular person in general, so it, it's really not my specialty. So I really helped with just making the RNA, making sure it functioned, making sure we could deliver it. But it's, and it's RNA and saline. There's no lipid nanoparticles. There's no polymers. It's saline. It's, it's salt water and RNA that we injected into the heart. And um, I think everyone was quite surprised that that actually works. Um, but just the same, it appears to, and it worked in rats and it worked in pigs and hopefully it'll work in people. The pig heart is pretty similar to a human's heart. So I think there's a very good chance it'll work. And the damage that they do in the model is pretty severe. So it's much worse than you'd have in a person. So I think that it has a high probability of working, but there's more work to do. Hopefully Novartis will take that into the clinic uh, and move it forward. They do have an RNA. Most of the major drug companies have RNA folks in their, in their midst. And so um, I think now they're kind of being brought to the forefront because finally something's gotten into, into the clinic, obviously with mRNA. And so that, that's kind of where we are at the moment. But I think you know, that can be done. Uh, there are folks looking at using this type of technology for heart damage after, um, uh, after heart attacks and that sort of thing, because, you know, you can express lots of different genes, proteins that can be regenerative. And so um, I think there's, honestly, I think there's a lot to do. I mean, we've even done delivery to the brain. We've done that in, in mice uh, and it actually worked surprisingly well. And so I'm actually writing a grant this, you know, this fall, which we'll see how it does, but basically to use that gene modulation technology, the technology to turn genes on and off, um, to actually go after addiction. So one of the problems oh. with people addicted to drugs is that as soon as you, 
supposedly as soon as you take many illicit, you know, illegal drugs, there are changes in your brain. I mean, it changes the DNA in your neurons. It, it adds these marks to it. And essentially those marks are hard to get rid of. And so that gene modulation technology I was talking about with the dead version of Cas9, we can actually use it to change those marks. And so we're doing those kinds of experiments now in the liver, but I know we can deliver them to the brain. And, I, and this isn't something that's gonna happen tomorrow, but if you could start you know, essentially removing that programming that the drugs are doing, you might have a good chance of actually preventing folks from being quite as addicted as they are. And I think this is clearly important for, important for opioids. And so, but there's other drugs too. And so I think that, you know, trying to get at addiction in a way that's, that's physiologic because they, these drugs are making physiologic changes, cell you know, changes to your DNA. Can we go in and correct those? Because currently we have no technology to do that. So that's an idea that I'm going to throw at the NIH and see what happens. They have a few, <laughs> they have some grants that are for also crazy ideas. And so it's something that, um, that I think is definitely a possibility. And DARPA actually helped fund some of the initial work that I did on delivery to the brain. So, so the reality is, is that's, that's why I love DARPA, is that they allow us to try things that are new and exciting. And sometimes they don't pan out, it's true, but sometimes you hit a home run. And so, and that's, what, that's kind of what they're hoping for. But um, I think that addiction is such an important problem in the world that, uh, and in the country, that if we can help folks, you know, in a biological way, it's so not like you're a bad person because you're addicted to the drug, but actually the drug is changing your brain. And so can we actually go in and change that back and hopefully have effects on addiction? So that's, that's one of my other wild ideas. Great. So. Uh, Kathy had a question. Kathy, you're speaking, you're on, uh, unmuted, go ahead. Okay, hi, Phil. I just wanted to know how come some vaccines seem to be like a one and done, but others might need a booster? How do you determine if and when a booster might be needed? Sure, that really comes down to antibody amounts. So what they're looking at is that when they first decided, they looked at people with, uh, they looked at convalescent sera. So they looked at how much antibody was being made by people who were actually infected, say with SARS COVID, with COVID. So the folks who were infected, they looked at how much antibody, especially the people that recovered, how much antibody was being made. And so essentially they looked at how much antibody would they make through their first dose and how much antibody would they make through their second? Well, with the mRNA based vaccines, they got to that level or higher through the second dose. And that's why they did it. I mean, it's, it's simple math. I mean, they just weren't getting as much. Now, why that is, it's a lot of different reasons, but I think in general, they wanted to achieve that level and that was their benchmark. And so they needed two doses to achieve that. But I think by doing that, they, they, got, they were able to achieve much higher levels of efficacy than if they had only gone with one. One does give you some protection, that's been shown, but two is definitely a whole lot better. And I think, Kathy, you're referring to the six month where they're saying that- uh, Oh, you're doing a bit of boost. Uh, so in terms of it, yeah, so what does happen though, so, so that gets you up, the first two doses get you up to that level. Unfortunately, it, durability, and I've actually been quoted um, in a couple of journals. I was interviewed by folks at Nature and Nature Biotech about this issue. Durability still was a question. I mean, that was a question from day one. How long would they last? Well, one of the problems is that you see over time, you do see the, MR, the antibody levels are starting to wane. They're going down. Now, that's, this doesn't mean you're unprotected, but it, because you also have memory cells that will remember the virus and go, oh, uh, I've seen this again. This isn't good. I need to do something about it. Um, I haven't seen too much data on memory responses, but they, they should be there. But the problem is, is that just the fact that your their antibodies are coming down a little bit, they want to, that's what's helping them decide when to boost. So they're trying to figure out how far down can they go before people are going to start, are going to get, start getting, really start getting sick again, end up in the hospital, ICU, that kind of stuff. And so they're going to want to boost before that. Probably you know, more like a month before that to see that you can actually get those levels back up to the levels that they are comfortable with and with the efficacy that they're comfortable with. The other thing they're probably going to have to do, though, is change the sequence. So the current spikes that are being the sequence in the mRNA is from Washington one, the one that I showed you earlier today. 
The problem is we have all these variants. So which strains they're which ones are they going to put in? I think is unclear. I think they'll probably use. I think some of them are using Delta because Delta is starting to become dominant in the U.S. And so I think they'll they'll have to come up with flavors of this again, plug and play technology that essentially um, is going to work for the most prevalent viruses. I mean, what is the one that you're? What strain are you going to see the most? If it's Delta, then they better put Delta in there. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Sure. I think there's some other questions. Um, oh yeah. Okay, that was Kathy. Got it. I'm happy to answer anything I can about vaccines, therapies, anything you want. Hmm. Bill, do you think that they'll come out with a new vaccine for the variants or just like a booster? I think more like a booster. I'm not sure though what Novavax is doing. So they have a completely different technology where they're using uh, sort of a protein nanoparticle. And I don't know if they're gonna actually come out with one with the old strains or with one of the new ones or not, but I, it'll probably just be a boost. I doubt you'll have to go get two more shots. I think it'll probably depend on their results, but hopefully it'll just be a single boost. Thank you. Sure. And I know, you know, the vaccine technology seems like it's super new, but keep in mind, as I said, DARPA was funding this like 10 years ago. And so right. the, the, they were, and they actually, so Moderna, so I know also people have questions about how, how were they able to go so fast? So that's where the plug and play idea came. And so, um, oh, I'll talk about, yeah, these, the, uh, the, the vaccine reactions, I'll get to that. But the reason they were able to do this is that Moderna had a lipid particle that they were using for flu that they had already put in people for a phase one trial. They just took the mRNA for uh, hemagglutinin, which is for flu, they took that out, they put the spike in, vaccine. That's why they were able to do it so fast. It's the plug and play nature more than anything else now. Yeah, so I think that, you know, there's a lot of questions about where do vaccine reactions come from? So it's pretty unlikely it's the RNA. I'll say that at least. The reason for, and I'm talking really most about the RNA-based vaccines. J&J &J is not an RNA-based vaccine. It's an adenovirus. So it's something called AD26. It's, a, it's actually a virus that they're giving you, one that doesn't cause disease, but it's a virus particle. And so it's a little bit different in terms of how it works, but at least on the RNA side, we know that the RNA is not immunogenic. I talked about that early on. So you shouldn't really have any allergies to the RNA, but there are four different parts. And I had a slide on this earlier, but I skipped it. I can go back to it if you'd like, but there's four pieces, four chemicals that are involved in its formulation. There's something called an ionizable lipid. There's a PEG lipid. So polyethylene glycol fused to a, a piece of fat lipid. There's cholesterol and uh, there's usually another helper, a helper lipid. And so, so there are these lipids. And I think the amount of PEG, some people are allergic to PEG, even though anyone who uses toothpaste has been exposing themselves to ridiculous amounts of PEG all the time because all of your toothpaste has it. And it's going to get into your system through the mucosa in your mouth very easily. So I don't think it, people first thought it was PEG. I don't think it's PEG that's causing some of these issues. I really think it has to do with the lipids. So the lipids have the job of driving inflammation because a little bit of inflammation for a vaccine is actually a good thing. You, when you get inflammation, you actually get, I would say, you know, you recruit immune cells, which you want. You want them to pick up the spike protein that's being made by the, by the RNA. You want some of that. Unfortunately, some people are definitely, um, yeah, we'll get to cancer cells in two seconds. So um, some people are, I think, sensitive to some of that inflammation. And so what they may need to do is kind of tone it down a little bit. And I think that for some folks, they're just more sensitive to inflammation. And you might say, why, why myocarditis? Um, probably because some of what gets injected, most of what gets injected into your arm stays in the muscle and in the draining lymph nodes, your axillary lymph nodes, say in your armpit, kind of near there, a little bit of it does end up in circulation. Cause I mean, you have blood vessels that go through the muscle. So some of it's going to end up in circulation. So a small amount of it is going to be seen by the heart. It's going to be seen by the endothelium, the cells that line your 
basically line your um, your vasculature. And so it is true that some of that may, depending on the person, they may be sensitive to some of those lipids. And that's really, I think there's this balance of you want inflammation, inflammation's good. As a matter of fact, there are some vaccines, I can tell you that are a lot worse than this one when it comes to how much uh, agony they cause and uh, in terms of your arm, how much pain you're in, and then how uncomfortable people feel afterwards. These are actually not too bad, but it is true. We're looking at them very, very closely. And so we do see these cases. So I do think over time, they'll probably turn down, they'll change the chemistry slightly to tune down that inflammation, especially for people that might be sensitive. So I do think it's the lipids, not necessarily the peg, because there's just not that much peg there. Um, there are, so does that, I hope that helps a little bit. It's about tuning the amount of inflammation that you have because some of it's good, like inflammation after you get cut or you have a wound, you need inflammation. You wouldn't heal without inflammation. I mean, inflammation is this double-edged sword. It's a good thing and you need it, but if you have too much for too long and in certain people, it can cause problems. I, I hope that helps clarify that. Okay. So cancer cells. So, and modification. So the mRNA-based vaccines should not induce, I mean, they don't get, they really don't get integrated. If without integration, they should induce any kind of tumor genicity. Uh, they do not actually, the chances of the mRNA-based vaccines either uh, causing problems in terms of cancer is, I think it's zero. I mean, they're only in your body for a few days. I mean, they're only expressing for a few days, to be perfectly honest. So cancer usually takes a lot of time to develop. Now, I, I'm not sure if that's your question or whether maybe the question is about using cancer cells or other cells to make the viruses. The mRNA ones do not use at all, do not use cells to make the vaccine at all. The it is true, the adenovirus one is, cells are used to make them. They use something called HEC293T cells, and those cells are used. They are um, a little bit, uh, how do I put it? Um, they're a cell line, which means they've been engineered to function forever. Um, they did come from uh, an embryonic stem cell from about 1972, if I remember, from the Netherlands. They did not come from the United States. They're actually a cell that came from, and so, I mean, um, but people, but I can tell you that that cell line uh, continues to propagate. People don't, oh, can it be used against cancer cells? Oh, that's an easier one. Okay, okay. So, so I don't, so I, I can't see that question. Who's asking? that question? Patricia McMahon asked about, can it work against cancer cells? It. That's okay. true. So yes. <laughs> and so I think cancer is this. So we're actually working on a vaccine approach with some folks at Yale. So I have some colleagues at Yale that make a special kind of immune cell. They take your blood, they put it in a device and they make a special kind of immune cell. What we've shown recently, and we haven't published this yet, is that you can take mRNA that encodes for a cancer antigen Put it in, in so take those LNPs, put it in the blood, goes through the device, and it takes those immune cells, and they get really excited to go kill the cells that make that protein. And so we actually used it for COVID in a vaccine. It worked actually really well. But at the same time, uh, this is a, they're a cancer lab, actually, and we are going to be testing it against, uh, I think, melanoma first, just because they have melanoma models. But absolutely, I mean, uh, a lot of the technology I talked about, gene modulation could be incredibly helpful for cancer and cancer cells, altering gene expression in cells, reprogramming them, trying to get them to be normal again. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of this technology and mRNA technology, cancer, it, actually, it's funny, BioNTech, that, is their, that was their thing was cancer. I actually visited BioNTech there in Mainz, Germany a few years ago, and that was their thing wasn't COVID or infectious disease. Um, obviously they pivoted because of the, um, the pandemic, but the reality is they were all about cancer. Now there's a couple of reasons why that is. Um, pharmaceutical companies make a lot of money off of cancer, to be perfectly honest. It's a big money maker. I mean, I'm, just to be honest, they can charge a lot for cancer drugs. So that's one motivation, not a particularly good one, but it is a motivation to be, I'm just being super honest. At the same time though, this is good technology to use against cancer. And I would say, I think mRNA is used for cancer technology, either cancer vaccines. So I'm working with another company called Replicate Bio on cancer vaccines. They use a different kind of RNA, but we did some formulation for them. They're going after cervical cancer, trying to make a better cervical cancer. Um, HPV basically vaccine. Uh, there are other folks who want to do this. I mean, I think cancer is the next 
I mean, COVID has sort of consumed everything at the moment, but cancer is the next frontier. It is the place where all of this technology, uh, whether it's vaccines or therapeutics, it's the next place for it. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And we need new paradigms for cancer. I mean, immunotherapies have been helpful, but you know, when you still look at the data, you're like, eh, you know, oh, a person got six more months to live. I mean, that's great. It's good, not a bad thing, but we don't want six more months to live. We want them to be cured. And so yeah. we need new paradigms. So mRNA, I think is gonna be a part of that. I think it's gonna happen in a lot of different ways, but I think mRNA is a very, very much could be part of that, part of that conversation, whether it's a vaccine. Remember, cancer vaccines are a little bit different. They're more like treatments. They're not preventative. They're there to treat the, can the tumor. But I think there are going to be cancer vaccines or cancer treatments that will be mRNA based in the near future. Absolutely. And I think that it is the next frontier. I mean, I think that's that's where you're going to see if COVID kind of, you know, if the va if we get enough people vaccinated, we can get it to sort of at least become more like seasonal flu. Now you're going to see a big shift over to cancer. No question. Mm. Okay, Phil, so I think uh, I have one last question and then we'll let you go because I know you have lots of important work to get back to. Um, what are some of the, uh, and I don't feel this way, but what are some of the people who question the ethics of what, what's going on in your lab and what you're doing uh, down the road? So I think the way I, I like to talk about it, so it depends on you know all of the drugs that we're working on right now a, we can make in the lab. They don't involve you know, cells, so that's a good thing. So there's no stem cells, no old embryonic stem cells. There's no, we don't use any of those to make our drugs. So I think that's a positive. So at least from the ethical, from the, an ethical perspective, the production of the drug shouldn't bother anybody. It's made in a tube, essentially. So that's a good thing. I think the next part is animal work. Some folks don't like to see lungs like I showed you. You know, I mean, I would love to not ever use an animal. My wife's a veterinarian. And so to be honest, I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to kill an animal or euthanize an animal. And again, it's all done humanely, but still you have to do it. I don't ever want to do that if I don't have to. And we try very hard to limit the number of animals we use for any experiments whatsoever. The problem is we do not have anything, all that cell work in a cells in a dish it doesn't tell you enough. I mean, that's where the real problem is. It doesn't tell us enough. So the reality is that until we come up with a better system, another way to model what's going on in these diseases, animals are the only other option. And so it's just the only way we have to determine whether or not you know, they're safe. The other issue, I guess I would say in terms of ethics are these CRISPR drugs. And we have, our program has a rule. You cannot cut DNA. And so we do not cut DNA in this program. And I mean, seriously, it was written into the original contract. It was like, you cannot cut DNA. And the reason for that is DARPA did not want, I think they didn't want folks to think that the Department of Defense was developing drugs that can cut people's DNA. It looks bad, to be perfectly honest. And so we had many discussions about the optics of this project. And so it's really important that we don't, you know, that that's not the case. So what I would say is that, all of our drugs cut RNA and they cut transiently. And they, and even when we bind to DNA to alter gene expression, it's transient and it doesn't cut the DNA. It doesn't alter it permanently. So nothing, none of the drugs that we're working on alter you permanently. And I know that freaks people out too. It's like the vaccine's gonna alter us in some way. I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff. It's like none of the mRNA based vaccines are gonna alter you permanently in any way because the mRNA is gone by three, four days, five days tops, you know, it's gone. I mean, and it doesn't get into the nucleus. It doesn't change your DNA. It's RNA, not DNA. It doesn't integrate. It doesn't get put inside into your DNA. And so, so the reality is that to me, these are some of the safest Actually, there's some of the safest vaccines and drugs we could possibly make because they, they have those qualities. They're transient. They don't permanently alter anything. So I guess from my perspective, you know, this work is, but the only problem, here's the difficulty. There are some diseases where we do need to make permanent changes. People do have problems that are permanent. Like those folks they used, Intellia used Cas9 against, you know, they were gonna die essentially if they didn't have that change. So, so the reality is I think that we have to think about the ethics carefully. If someone's gonna die from a disease, can we, can we not alter them to get them to, to, you know, cause them to live? So I think it's not, you can't think of like one, um, 
one situation fits all, so to, th so to speak. You know, it really has to be looked at the case by case basis. Now, a lot of the stuff that we're developing, honestly, from a military perspective is for healthy, relatively healthy people. And so even if, you know, if it's gonna go, if it's for flu in the military, let's just say, they're giving it to young people. They're in their 20s, mostly 30s. And so these are healthy people. We can't alter the DNA of someone who's 30 years old. I mean, that is going to be bad. I'm like, I don't want to do that. And so, so that's why it's really important that if you're thinking about relatively healthy people, you know, to make sure that it's safe, you know, that they're safe. Now, I just got a question. So I guess those are how we think of the ethical issues. What's what's the indication? Who are the folks that it's being used in? you know, how, how transient, how safe is what we're using? Um, what's, are there any inherent, you know, potholes, so to speak, or red flags in the approach? And so we try to consider that every day. And that's like through everything we do, whether it's in animals and cells, what cells are we using? You just have to think about the ethics of everything you're doing and weigh it against the, the positives. I mean, um, that's really, and, and really thinking about in the end, we can't do any harm. I'm not a physician, but it's the same idea as the, you know, in the end, we don't want these drugs to do any harm. So someone that said, is it really safe for teens and young adults? And, and I would say, you know, I think so far the data would say yes. Um, so I think that that's the case. Again, it is transient. I think they are looking at different dosing for, for younger people. But um, I would say if Delta ends up being as problematic for kids uh, as it looks like it, you know, as it has been in India, then uh, I think we, you know, again, you have to weigh the positive. If, if you know, my sister's a physician in, in Indiana and was saying that 30% of the kids they had showing up in the, in the ICU all had Delta. I mean, they were. I mean, it was it was a huge number of kids showing up uh, with Delta. So I guess my question would be, you know, you have to weigh, and I think everyone's trying to do that. Weigh the positives and the negatives. I mean, every drug, vaccine, whatever, has risks. I mean, um, I would say if you live in Atlanta, driving around 285 has enormous risks. <laughs> I'm always worried about being. I mean, I'm not joking. I mean, it's like. It's a little scary. It's quite scary, actually. So I think that, you know, we have to, how we evaluate risk is something that as a community and as a country, we really need to start thinking about. It's like, and I think you should think about it yourself. How do you, how do you evaluate risk on a daily basis? Some things we take for granted. I get in my car every day. And then, then you drive by these signs are like, oh, 3000 people were killed today in cars. And you're like, oh, I guess that's no big deal. Well, it's 3000 people. I mean, you know, I think that we just have to be thoughtful about how we evaluate risk. What data are we using to evaluate risk? And so when you say it's safe, what do we mean by safety? Does it mean that nothing will happen or does it mean that something very bad will happen? And I think, you know, we've really got to think carefully and objectively about risk. But I think we need to do that again for what we drink, what we eat, what we, how we function. And I think we get used to uh, just being very um, nonchalant about some things that are actually horribly risky. I mean, I'll give you another example of a drug, birth control. So hormonal-based birth control in women has, if you go look at the numbers, crazy risks. I mean, it's really shocking, actually. But women have done it now for decades. And they're sort of that we've sort of assumed that that risk was acceptable. Should it be? I'm not sure. <laughs> but the point is that we need to evaluate that risk based on data, not just and I think that kind of leads to another whole conversation, which could take up a lot of time, which is on information and what's good information. What are good sources of information? How do you evaluate information? We do this with students all the time. And this is just, to me, these are bigger questions that we have to be asking ourselves. I don't want to get philosophical, but I think that, you know, in terms of how do we evaluate risk? How do we evaluate safety? What metrics are we using? How can we be as objective as possible? And how can we get the best data in order to make actual informed decisions? Our world doesn't talk about that. We get talking heads on TV with like random pieces of information. I don't think that's the way this should be done, but you know, they don't ask me. <laughs> and so, but I'm just saying that I think that, you know, people want good information. I think we're all tired of crappy information. And so how do we get it? And how do we make sure that it's not biased, that there isn't, you know, right. a lot, anything behind it? So I think that's a broader conversation, but it's playing out in these issues of vaccines, treatments, drugs. It's, it's coming to the forefront, but I think it's an issue that's been actually confronting us now for years. So right. I don't think I answered your question, but I hopefully no, 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 you, you said more than, more than enough. This has been great. Uh, this is great. I, I want to just thank, I want to 
thank Phil for uh, giving up his time and and, uh, and and his information and and filling us with such good information. Uh, this has been this has been fabulous, Bill. So uh, and and as your former teacher, you've made me proud once again. But, uh, <laughs> uh, anyone else have any final words? Just jump in and anything. Oh, no, this was great. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you.